Okay, welcome everyone. This is the second lecture for PNG Politics External Mode. Um, in this lecture, we're going to cover units three and four. Okay, unit three is titled "The Role of Colonial State in Development Process," and unit four main features of Westminster parliamentary democracy. Okay. Um, well, the theme of this discussion is uh, the colonial policy and state formation. So basically, we are moving towards okay, the colonial uh, policy era right in, up into state formation. Um, so for today, uh, we're going to the lecture outline is we're going to look at the introduction. Um, we're going to talk about the colonial policy and the transition. Okay. Uh, after that, we're going to talk about state formation. Okay, and the Westminster system, and uh, to, to talk uh, conclude. Okay. So important is for today's uh, this lecture discussion reading. This is chapter thirteen from this book here. Again, this book titled The Development and Dependency, The Political Economy of PNG. Um, we're going to uh, look at chapter 13, which is titled The Colonial State, Paternalism and Mystification. So basically the chapter uh, gives an in-depth uh, discussion on uh, the colonial policy, okay, right up uh, 1912 and then come up to the 1960s, okay, before self-government, okay. On that, that reading will also uh, go with this reading here. It's titled On the Third Wave Democratization, a synthesis and evaluation of recent theory and research by uh, Don Charles Shin. Okay, so these are the two readings that will add value to our discussions here. Okay, let's start. So, okay, let's Okay, so let's look at the first discussion, which is colonial policy and transition. Okay, now again here you may be uh, familiar with this the, uh, the diagrams uh, illustration here. As I um, talk a little bit on this uh, illustration when I touch the political dimension in the first lecture video. Okay, however, so um, I'll try to expound a little bit further on this idea here. So we know that by 18th century, the, we saw the birth of the uh, representative democracy in Europe, particularly in Britain through the Glorious Revolution and in France through French Revolution. So um, the people wanted a sort of government that is reflective, okay, or represents the people. Okay, now that conflict started of in 1215 or 1215s through the Magna Carta so there was this conflict back and forth with the people okay and the feudal structure the kings and queens okay over the years up until the 18th century okay let's see the downfall of the feudal structure and the birth of representative democracy so uh, this idea of form of democracy came into pl uh, play or called the representative democracy in that uh, idea, we have people okay, who wanted a form of government through representation created the legislature, okay, and in our case, in British uh, Parliament, and then through the legislature, so the creation or establishment of the state. Okay. However, that idea of representative democracy is different from those countries that adopted, okay, that uh, adopted the idea of representative democracy okay and so Samuel Huntington in his book titled the third wave uh, democracy or the third wave theory of democracy highlighted this important aspect here for those countries that came after let's say through the decolonization process okay uh, after 1974 and Papua New Guinea is one of those those that accepted the idea or embrace the concept or ex not embrace sorry but accepted uh, the idea of representative democracy in their political system so for those states they usually go through four stages 
in order to for democracy to mature okay or its maturity state okay so in those countries let's say in the 1960 democratization most of these countries um, have saw the creation of the state first institutions okay and the legislature okay and then the elections for that manner okay or for that matter sorry the uh universal suffrage was introduced later okay so that is where you have countries in this region that are having problems in trying to consolidate okay and trying to accept embrace and problems of inculcating values or democratic ideas and principles and Papua New Guinea is one uh, of such countries Okay, so for for these discussions here, I want us to know or try to uh, have that idea in place that the basis of political power in Papua New Guinea is found or based within the institutions, okay? The institutional structure or uh, our constitution, okay? Now, the question is, okay, let's see. How do you turn that upside down triangle into an upright triangle and you address the issue of political power okay bring back the political power in the ends of the civic society civil society or the people okay now that will come through a change of uh, a democratic change within the political system okay so the process of change towards more democratic forms of rule Okay, first of all, there needs to be a breakdown of non-democratic regime. Okay, that is the democratization process. Okay, it's through democratization process that we can live, uh, reach a certain uh, level of maturity in our democracy. Okay. So, starting with breakdown of non-democratic regime or authoritarian regime, the elements of democratic are order and established, and then consolidation takes place. The new democracy is further developed. And eventually, democratic practices became an established part of the political culture. And we, uh, in Papua New Guinea, we are trying to uh, reach that stage where democratic practices become an established part of our political culture. Now, this is the process of democratization itself. So, every country is the third wave. Okay, when Samuel Huntington talks about the third wave, third, third wave, he talks about that uh, he. He states that every country goes through that process. Okay, first of all, the decay of authoritarianism. Okay, and then the transitional phase, the consolidation phase, and maturity of our democracy. Okay, in our case, for example, uh, the decay of authoritarianism, uh, authoritarian structure started in 1949 through the introduction of, or introduction through the consolidation of both new papua and new guinea territory through the 1949 papua and new guinea territory act okay 1951 we saw the um, establishment of the first legislative council so these political structures those institutions were starting to take shape okay until 1964 we had the first house of assembly 1968 the second house of assembly in 1975 we've okay uh, Papua New Guinea got its independence, okay, and that is for our case the transitional phase, democratic transition period, and then we, after independence, uh, we are going through this stage of democratic consolidation, trying to embrace or reach the maturity of democracy, okay, um, we have not reached that level as yet, as you can see in most in our elections, okay, as far as our elections is concerned. Um, allegations of abuses in offices for that matter so those issues one way or the other taint a a bad image on democratic consolidation okay now that's that's important because that sort of forms the basis of what we are trying to discuss here now Starting from the decay of authoritarianism, there were two important policies that sort of guide the colonial policy of uh, Australia on the mandated territory of both Papua and New Guinea. Okay, after the Germans left uh, in World War One, the Australian colonial administration took over. 
there were very two very important policies that were instituted during that time okay the first one is the paternalistic policy of native administration from 1888 to 1940 okay, this was used by the british under uh, william mcgregor and then later hubert murray the second was the policy of gradualism from 1945 to 1960 and gradualism was the guiding principle in intervention undertaken by Governor Paul Aslak okay, and Charles Baines okay, in their capacities as ministers for territories. Okay. Now, for example, paternalistic policy, you can see the policy um, sort of, you can see an example would be curfews. Okay, there are certain parts, for example, in Port Mosby where uh, the indigenous, okay, were not allowed to go, or certain activities that the indigenous people were not allowed to take part in. There are certain limits to time where traditional, let's say, kundus or garamuts should be stopped. For example, around let's say 9 p.m. that all noises or traditional dances or ceremonies should be ceased okay this is an example of the paternalistic policy that was instituted now the idea was to number one have presence in the mandated ter ter territories and number two to have a control over the population now that is the decentralized administrative structure that was instituted by the colonial administration now that native administration was changed after 1945 and we know the stories of father was the angels and um, the various uh, actions by the indigenous okay our people during that time in their effort in helping the australian army or the british forces okay that sort of change the perception and, and, and image of the Australian colonial administration. Now that policy took on a, a different approach, okay, after 1945 to 1960, okay, through the process of gradualism, okay. Uh, this is a, a, a policy where, okay, intervention development will be given, let's say, in dip, uh, dips and drabs, okay, slowly, step by step, okay. Um, that is guided by this 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 idea that okay at that time indigenous okay natives were um, okay sort of where we should be guided okay slowly gradually so that they would accept and embrace modernization at a step by step basis okay they are afraid of what modernization can do okay but. Probably they were, they were, during that time there was experience in India, the political mobilization under Gandhi, okay, and various uh, conflicts or political um, tensions pertaining to self-government and independence was going around um, the world during the time, and uh, this was very much uh, taken on board by the colonial administration to control the amount of political activity so uh, let's say to fully fledged modernize uh, modernization would also add let's say drop uh, setback well that's one of the many examples okay but the idea is that from a very paternalistic authoritarian there was some uh, flexibility and understanding and opening up of the administration to accept and work with the indigenous or the population uh, during the time and on the other hand Australian colonial policy okay, was also dictated by global events okay we, we saw the uh, World War II 19, post-1945 and changed the uh, perception of uh, colonial administration through the good works of the Fuzzy Wazzy Angels okay but also countries around the world were trying to okay get, uh, get self-government independence so the aftermath of world war ii okay and the importance of the establishment of the united nations also helped to steer okay the wind of changes in in looking at how the colonial administration administer the mandated territory 
not until 1962 when uh, the United Nations sent a a mission or visiting mission to uh, look at the mandated territories okay and that was sent by okay say you food okay okay recommended uh, a series of recommendations for Australian administration on Papua New Guinea or mandated territory okay the the report known as the food report okay reported on the administration of the new uh, mandated territory by the UN visiting mission in 1962 this had tremendous influence on the Australian policy itself for the territory okay now that report also indicated that the colonial administration was not doing enough in terms of preparing uh, the mandated territory of Papua New Guinea for self-government and independence okay and there was a massive shift in the administration itself and one of the uh the issues that was brought out was the lack of investment in education and that saw the administration now okay, expanding education which led to the creation of the university of papua new guinea in 19 um i think 1968 i'm not sure of the date okay so that for for instance that is an indication of let's say democratization process the decay of authoritarian and authoritarian authoritarianism okay from 1949 to 1964 we saw the change of paternalism to gradualism and then the foot report all in preparation for the transition phase okay Okay, now let's look at the parliamentary democracy. Okay, now by 1964, 1968, 1972, the first House of Assembly. Okay, the and and because of the colonial administration itself, okay, Papua New Guinea was geared towards embracing and accepting a parliamentary democracy, which is um, a parliamentary democracy that is uh, on the idea of the British model, which is the Westminster system. Okay. Now, in the British model, okay, the Westminster system works best with certain preconditions, okay? And one of that is to have a few or strong established political parties. The issues must be constituency-driven issues. There must be a politically conscious public, okay? The must, citizens must have high regard for the rule of law. And there must be a vibrant alternate government okay and you see the key indicators there okay more or less papua new guinea okay up until the transition phase this is the issues or the areas that we failed in okay so even though we establish institutional structures okay that emerge gradually through the 1949 papua new guinea act 1951 uh, the legislative council 1964 to 68 house of assembly okay and the 1970s a gradual change acceptance of the westminster parliamentary system these indicators here preconditions here were absence okay the absence of these preconditions here okay results in the upside down uh, basis of political power now in the ends of the institutions these preconditions here Okay, preconditions here are very much important for the basis of power, political power, okay, to be established within the civil society here. Absence of these preconditions, okay, of uh, parliamentary democracy gives rise of power to the institutions. Okay, so Papua New Guinea, absence of that led to the establishment of political power within the state and the institution. Okay. Okay, so how do we categorize Papua New Guinea's democracy itself? Okay, we are okay. Ala under uh, in in Samuel Huntington's book, the third wave model, Papua New Guinea is categorized as a third wave democracy. Okay? However, Papua New Guinea is okay created through process. Okay, that is why Papua New Guinea is okay sort of called a procedural democracy okay procedural democracy why do we say that 
Okay, the reason why is that we go through the all nine yards of following procedures such as staging regular elections and allowing courts to adjudicate matters but fall short in terms of inculcating democratic ideals into the minds of the people. Our people have not yet embraced democracy, okay? That is why in our case here, the institution wields the political power. That's why, for example, if any members of parliament, okay, or top bureaucrats that hold public offices are alleged to be involved in corruption, they don't resign from each office and let due process take place, like most of the top public officials in Western democracy does. Rather, they run to the courts. Why? Because the political power lies within the courts and not the people. The po people only comes into play in election to check, or check off or tick off sorry, um, the uh, conditions Okay, a process of democracy in PNG. Okay, so we go through the all nine yards of following procedures, such as staging regular elections and allowing courts to adjudicate matters, but fall short in terms of inculcating democratic ideals into the minds of the people. Okay. Now, as you all know, you have this. This is very much a revision on uh, the course on introduction to government and politics, but. Okay, as parliamentary democracy is starting to take roots, also the idea of first minister system okay, started taking shape. Okay. So we inherited this first minister system from Great Britain through Australia and the system talks about the three distinct arms of the government. Okay, the legislature, the executive and the judiciary arm. Okay, the legislature usually make laws. Okay. The executive arms usually implement these laws and the judiciary interprets these laws. And these three arms of the government should be independent as much as possible. Okay, however, not so much in our case, but that is a discussion for a different time. Okay, but the idea is that a Westminster system of government hinges on this three important notion of separation of power. Okay, one arm is to make law, the legislature pass law on the floor of parliament, the executive, which is the government, okay, the, they initiate and implement these laws, and the judiciary or the court system that interpret these laws. Okay, let's look at our Westminster system and the state or the structure. Okay, so in, in, in British, we have a, a sort of uh, by okay, a, a two houses okay in that is not unitary okay um, you have the house of commons and the house of lords these two houses you, you you will not see that in Papua New Guinea okay Papua New Guinea is sort of sway towards a strong or centralized unitary system okay However, a unitary system that is often associated with a strong centralized, okay, state-centric government, okay. So instead of having a upper house and a upper and lower house, we have only one house, which is uh, the unitary uh, is attributed to the unitary system, where you have the executive and the alternate government sitting on both benches, the opposition and the government. Now, after independence, uh, self-government, the idea was to have a central structure of government, okay? A central structure that okay, is okay, similar to that of the colonial legacy or the colonial administration. However, okay, because of Bougainville, the secessionist movement on the island of Bougainville, which called for a separate self-government, which saw the government opted for a decentralization policy, which saw the creation of the 20 provincial government. Okay, and that also affected uh, the idea of uh, federalism in PNG, where we Papua New Guinea is called the quasi-federal system, where you have a centralized government, and at the same time uh, you have a twenty provinces existing outside of the centralized form of government. Okay. Now, from the nineteen eighty, we have the unitary system with twenty provinces of government. Okay, by 2020, 18 or 2022, 
Okay, we have 22 provinces. Okay. The issue is decentralization on power, but more of a centralization in practice. Okay. Now, in that, we inherited and we have a, a challenge in our, our structure as well. We have a strong MP voter relationship that is based on personalities of a, a, a particular figure. We inherited a weak party system that is okay. And as a result of weak party system, provide uh, opportunities for various actors to play and come in okay come in and play okay provide for opportunism and and that also with the unicameral house of parliament okay so the strong mps and voter relationship okay we have as a result of a party system okay the presence the lack of presence of political parties has also led us to be more Okay, dependent on the ethnic and tribal structure to determine our politics, not until the uh, introduction of the organic law on the integrity of political parties that tries to arise that. But we will talk about these issues here as we talk, as we discuss the OLIPEC and the elections, that most of this weakness of strong OMP voter relationship with party system, opportunism, and unicameral house, okay, that has to do with uh, the current arrangement, okay, state structure, where you have a decentralization, quasi-federal system, but more leaning towards a centralization state authority. Now, so to conclude this uh, discussion here, okay, Papua New Guinea, okay, went through the process of democratization itself, where democracy was introduced from top down, okay, we've Okay, started from the four phases. Okay, started off by okay, moving away from the Australian colonial administration, going into transition period, and we are in the state of consolidation at the moment. Okay, we've talked about the two colonial policy, the paternalistic and gradualism policy, and also the the the, the two policy here, paternalistic and gradualism policies, uh, very much. Okay, talked about in detail in chapter 13, titled um, Paternalism and Mystification, okay, by Rex Mortimer from this book here. So I will uh, upload this book for students to read, okay. Um, okay, we've talked about the Foot Report 1962 that started off of fast track political development towards uh, self government, okay. And the idea that Papua New Guinea is a procedural democracy, that we went through all the nine yards of uh, ticking all the boxes of democracy. However, we have not yet inculcated the values of democracy in the minds and hearts of the people. Okay, uh, we talked about the Westminster system that was introduced. Okay, not the bicameral house, but the unicameral house that. Mm, the emphasis was more on the centralized role of the state, okay, and not on decentralization. Although decentralization appeared to be on paper, the emphasis is on a building a strong state centralized structure. Okay, and then Papua New Guinea is still yes in its uh, consolidation phase of democratization, where it needs to build strong state structures. Okay, that is it for today's discussion and uh, we will um, catch up in the next discussion. Okay, with that, uh, thank you very much.